When people meet Jesus, when they really meet Jesus, everything changes, okay? Everything changes. That's what the series is all about, looking at some episodes in the life of Jesus Christ where people met him face to face and walked away totally different. Today is no different. We're going to be in Luke chapter 19. So you got a Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 19. While you're turning there, I'm going to begin with some trivia, all right? We got trivia for you this morning. And it's a very specific kind of trivia. This is which came first trivia, okay? So, you know, kind of like you've heard the phrase, which came first, the chicken or the egg, okay? <clears throat> this is all questions kind of like that, except there are clear right answers, okay? Okay, so here's the first one. Which came first, Wrigley Field or Wrigley's Chewing Gum? Yeah, there you go. That was a little softball. Wrigley's Chewing Gum was founded in 1891, okay? Wrigley Field was built in 1914, okay? So see how this works. Which of the following came first, the NFL or the NBA? Football or basketball? How many think football? How many think basketball? All you basketball people are wrong. It is the NFL. That's fun. The NFL came in 1922, the NBA was in 1949, okay, let's keep going, we got some good ones here. Which came first, okay, this is now channels on TV, which came first, Nickelodeon or the Disney Channel? How many think Disney Channel? How many think Nickelodeon? Wow, yeah, Nickelodeon, that would be nice work, that was very well done, okay. <clears throat> 1979 for Nickelodeon, 1983 for the Disney Channel, okay, which came first, all right, this is films. The Wizard of Oz or Gone with the Wind? How many think Gone with the Wind? How many think Wizard of Oz? Yeah, Wizard of Oz people are correct. 1939, August 25th, 1939. Gone with the Wind was December 15th, 1939. See? <laughs> you think, oh, that's net. Yeah, it's going to be like that, okay? It's going to be like that. You come here, bring your A game, okay? Which came first? Alaska's admission to the Union or Hawaii's admission to the Union? How many think Hawaii? How many think Alaska? Yeah, it's Alaska, man. January 3rd, 1959. Hawaii came in August 21st, 1959. See? You just got to know these details. Makes it better in life. Okay. Which came first, Coke or Pepsi? Yeah, you all knew that one. See? See? Jeff Samuels, wherever you are, man, you got to know, Coke came first. It's the original, 1886 for Coke, 1903 for Pepsi. Okay, Star Wars or Star Trek? Oh, a little murmurs out there. Yeah, okay, so how many think Star Wars came first? Like, how many think Star Trek came first? Yeah, Star Trek came first, 1966. Star Wars was 1977. Okay. Let the, let's make this biblical. Which came first? Now we're talking when they lived, okay? Not in the order of the Bible, okay? But which, when they lived in history. Which came first, Amos or Obadiah? Anybody know? Anybody have an idea? Somebody's Googling on their phone real quick. <laughs> okay, it's Amos. Amos came first, about 760 B.C., Obadiah century later, okay? Now you know. See? Now you know. If anybody ever asks you, Amos came first. Okay, what about Hezekiah or Josiah? See, now you know. Hezekiah came first, okay? 715 BC, Josiah, roughly a century later. Okay, this one's a little easier. Jesus' baptism or Jesus' temptation? Which came first? And in the gospel accounts, his baptism came first, okay? Baptism came first. Okay, here's the last one. Which came first? Zacchaeus' desire to know Jesus or Jesus' desire to know Zacchaeus? Yeah, in your notes, here we go, the main thing. God moves first. 
God moves first. This is what this whole story is about, okay? And I'm going to read it in its, in, its, in its totality right here, and then we're going to break it down a little bit, okay? So Luke chapter 19, we're going to start in verse 1 in Luke chapter 19. We're going to cover 10 verses today. So here we go. <clears throat> Jesus entered Jericho. Okay, let's get a handle on what's going on here. If you remember last week, last week we actually covered the passage immediately before this in Luke 18. And that was where Jesus meets a blind beggar on the road. And he was on, his, on the road uh, toward Jericho because he's on the road to Jerusalem. Right, Jericho's on the way to Jerusalem, and he's heading in this direction. So just so you know, this is what is on his mind. He's going to Jerusalem because what's going to happen in Jerusalem? He's going to be crucified in Jerusalem, okay? So this is where we're headed, right? We're getting closer to Easter. So is he, right? This is the direction. So he's meeting these people on the way. First, he met the blind beggar, and now he's crossing into Jericho, and something else is going to happen. So Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. As I read this, note the movement. Note Jesus' movement and note Zacchaeus' movement, okay? So Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. He's moving. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Forgive me if I call him Zac, okay? Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. And he wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Anybody remember the song, right? Were you in Sunday school? Zacchaeus was a wee little... Okay, we're not going to sing it right now. (laughs) Come down right now. So he came down once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. You believe that? You believe that, Jesus? But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the son of man, key key verse, key verse, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Okay. God moves first. This is just true. We just see it in Scripture over and over again. God moves first. Salvation comes from the Lord, Jonah teaches us. Salvation comes from the Lord, which means that salvation, anybody getting saved from paying for their sin, for paying for the, the penalty of their sin in hell. Anyone who gets saved from that fate gets saved because salvation comes from the Lord and only from the Lord. Salvation is the Lord's idea, okay? It's his move, and the result is that we get saved and we respond to Jesus Christ. So, because God moves first, okay? This is the next thing in your notes, and then we're going to finish that sentence for the rest of the sermon. Okay, because God moves first, and here's number one, anyone can get saved. Anyone can get saved. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Is Zacchaeus a good guy or not a good guy? Yeah, he's not a good guy. In fact, I'd go so far as to say he's a scoundrel, okay? He's a scoundrel. Zacchaeus is a tax collector, right? And just to give you a little bit of history on this, tax collectors, as they're referred to in the Gospels, are Jews, right? So they're Jews, they're, they're native Jews and ethnic Jews, and, and they have decided to Uh, provide for themselves by uh, working for Rome, essentially. And they collect taxes on Rome's behalf. And because Rome is kind of, you know, loosey-goosey with some of the rules, it allows them to line their pockets, 
with whatever is left over as long as Rome gets what it wants. And so they can upcharge, they can triple charge, they can do all kinds of things, and we're doing this. In fact, Zacchaeus has already said in the stories we've seen it, he was doing this, okay? So do you think he was a popular guy? Okay, not probably not a super popular guy, except the circles in which he ran. Uh, but here's the thing, though. He's not just a tax collector. Zacchaeus is, what does it say? He's a chief tax collector. He's a chief tax collector. As best as we can tell in history, what this probably meant is it probably meant that there were tax collectors that worked and then they would place a few of them over a group of them. And he was one of those guys. So he's kind of running his own little tax collecting operation. Like this is who Zacchaeus is. So if I were, you know, I'm just, I'm not saying this is in the text. I'm just imagining myself as a sinful man being in this position. If I were in that position, I'd probably be collecting from the people, but I'd also probably be taking a cut from the people who were under me. If you can imagine that kind of corruption. All of this I just paint the picture with and, and challenge you to imagine exactly who Zacchaeus is because this, this is who Jesus has gone to see. Now what I want you to do right now in your mind is I want you to picture someone in your life who you would consider an unlikely convert unlikely convert to Christianity. <clears throat> Maybe the least likely in your life right now. Maybe it's somebody who did get saved a while ago and they were the most unlikely convert, but somebody for whom this would be an apt description. I think it'd be a helpful thing to have in our minds because the reality of the situation is God moves first in salvation, which means anyone can get saved. The Apostle Paul had an interesting thing to say about himself. He said it in 1 Timothy, and I'll go ahead and read it to you. You don't have to turn there. But he said to Timothy, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He said, Christ Jesus came into the world and his mission, his express purpose was to save sinners. And then he adds this phrase onto it. You remember what the phrase is? Of whom I am the chief. Or you might have a translation that says of whom I am the worst. He says, man, of, the, of that group, that group that you call sinners, I'm the captain of that group. In other words, nobody does it like I do it, right? Nobody messes it up like I mess it up. And that's, that's exactly who we're talking about when we're talking about Zacchaeus. So look in your notes, number one. Lost means lost, okay? There are no degrees of lostness. I just gotta make this clear. At one point in time, I, Stephen Lister, was lost. I was lost, and I needed Jesus. At one point in time, I was lost, and I needed Jesus. If you're a Christian here and listening to me, at one point in time, you were lost and also needed Jesus as well. And if you responded to Christ, and we have the exact same story because you and I were just as lost as each other. Now, you might think, well, but Pastor Steve, you know my story. Like my, but my pre-Jesus story includes drugs and sex and alcohol and rock and roll and all that stuff, all the, all the things you could imagine. And Pastor Steve, didn't you say that you got saved in a living room listening to a Billy Graham sermon when you were five years old? Yes, You say, how in the world do we have the same testimony? Because we were just as lost as one another. Before I met Jesus, I was just as lost as anyone who is lost. And we need to keep this in mind. We need to remember this because it helps us remember this very simple fact. Anyone can get saved. Salvation comes from the Lord, not from you and me, not from the church, not from a brilliant salvation or outreach strategy. It comes from God. So anyone can get saved. There are no degrees of lostness. We are all just as lost as one another before Christ. And number two, if anyone at all gets saved, anyone can get saved. 
You guys get this? If anyone at all gets saved, then anyone can get saved because we all get in the same door. We start from the same place. Zacchaeus was a tax collecting scoundrel, and yet salvation is coming to his house today. And the same was true for you and me. Okay? Anyone can get saved. That's the first way we're going to complete the sentence. Okay? No degrees of lostness. We like to think there are degrees of lostness, but there are not. One time when my wife and I were driving home from somewhere up north, I have this thing that I tell her all the time, because really, truly, in general, it's true. My wife tends to not be gifted with directions, and I... I'm just saying she's wonderful in every other way, but this way is, you know. And, and then me, I tend to be good at directions. And one time I just spouted off the phrase right before we left. I don't know why I did it, but she's like, hey, do you want me to look this up in the phone, like our drive home? And I said, no, listen, I always know where I am, okay? She's looking at me. She remembers this story exactly. She remembers the story. I said, I always know where I am. Apparently, the Lord thought it was time for a lesson in humility. <laughs> in my defense, 31 was closed, okay, in my defense for like a long time. So you had to drive around. And when you drive around up here, it's really easy to not know if you're pointed north or south or east or west after a little while, okay, when you're being sent on detours, right? And then she's like, do you want me to look it up? Do you want me to look it up? And I'm like, No. Listen, I'm not lost. I'm not lost. And then finally I said, listen, I might be a little lost. <laughs> said, I'm a little lost. There's no little lost. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're either lost or you're found. There, there's nothing in between. And the same thing is true for us spiritually. If I'm lost, I'm lost and without Jesus. And then when I'm with Jesus, I'm found. And this, everybody starts from the same place and God moves first. And because he moves first, anyone can get saved. Okay, here's number two. Because God moves first, our initiative is not what saves us. The initiative of Jesus is what saves us. Okay, I'm going to say that again. Because God moves first, our initiative is not what saves us. The initiative of Jesus is what saves us. Okay, look at the, look at the story. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Here's verse 3. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could, I'm not making fun of that, okay? I'm not judging short people in this sermon, right? Just, just saying. Scott, Scott Payton, I'm not, no judgment, okay? He pointed me out before I pointed him out, okay? I'm not trying to, I'm just saying. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do, right? Okay. So he climbs a sycamore fig tree to see him because he wanted to see who he was. And since Jesus was coming that way, um, th this, is, this is what is so interesting to me about this story. We learn two things about Zacchaeus. We learn, number one, that he's a pretty terrible guy, okay? Unsaved, terrible guy. But here's the other thing we learn about Zacchaeus. He's a seeking guy. He's a seeking guy. You see, this, this whole thing begins, at least in the way that we have it reported here, the whole thing begins because something happens in Zacchaeus' mind when he hears that Jesus is passing through. Somebody mentions, hey, Jesus, Jesus Christ is passing through. And so he, verse 3, wanted to see who Jesus was. So we can assume that Zacchaeus has some level of spiritual curiosity when it comes to who Jesus is. Because it's occurring to him that he wants to go see who Jesus was. And so he responds by not only leaving wherever he was and going to wherever the crowd was, but then he sees the crowd and sees another obstacle because he's challenged in the height department. And so he decides he's going to climb up a tree to get to see who Jesus is. Now, here's what I want you to imagine here. I want you to imagine that him climbing the tree is not just a historical report, but it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for his seeking of Jesus Christ. He's climbing the tree. He wants to see who Jesus is so badly that he's climbing up the tree to get to him.
But what's Jesus doing? Has Jesus been moving this whole time? That Zacchaeus has been moving? Yes. He's been moving this entire time. Where's he been moving to? Where's he going? Well, we said Jerusalem, right? But, but that's, that's the big picture of where Jesus is going. You see, there's a collision course happening in this story. Jesus is moving one way, and Zacchaeus is headed right for him. But what's so interesting to me is, I think, I think Jesus was headed to Zacchaeus' place the entire time. Okay? Jesus was headed for him. Listen, we live in a world full of people trying to save themselves. We live in a world full of people trying to save themselves, reaching, climbing the tree. And here's the truth. It doesn't matter how high we reach or how far up we climb toward God. That's not what gets this done. Does Zacchaeus get saved because he climbed the tree? No. In fact, what's the first thing Jesus tells him to do? Get down. That's the first thing he tells him to do. He's this, this movement, you see this? Zacchaeus is moving toward Jesus, seeking Jesus, climbing up the tree to try to get to him. And yet when Jesus gets there, the first thing Jesus tells him to do is to climb down. It's because it's this. This story, the salvation that comes to Zacchaeus is not about where Zacchaeus is. It's not about that. It's about where Jesus is and where he goes to go get him. He's up in the tree, he's reaching up, but Jesus tells him to get down because Jesus is the one who's headed toward him. Listen, every other world religion is about climbing the tree. Every other world religion is about climbing the tree toward God. For Buddhists, you attain nirvana through progression in the understanding of Buddhist teachings. For Hindus, progression is in the the works and in knowledge and devotion that's how you get saved for non-religious people in our world today it's reaching your potential through self-actualization that's how you do it we do not get saved because we do enough good things so here's in your notes look at this we are not saved because we're spiritual you hear a lot of people in this world talk about being spiritual i'm spiritually minded so therefore, I, I, I ascend to somewhere on a spiritual plane, and that's where I go, and that's what works for me. And here's what I'm telling you. We don't get saved because we're spiritual people. We don't get saved because we climb the right tree or climb the right ladder or choose the right path toward God. It's not about the path that we choose toward God. It's about the path that Jesus has chosen toward us. And so if that's the truth, then here's number three. Because God moves first, the the moment of our salvation is a moment God ordained before we were born. Because God moves first, the moment of our salvation is a moment God ordained before we were born. Okay, I want to show you my favorite verse in this story. It's verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. You know why this is my favorite verse in the story? It's because it says, when Jesus reached the, what's that word? Spot. It doesn't say when Jesus got to Zacchaeus' house. It doesn't say when Jesus got to to Jericho or to the main part of town or to any of those things. It says, literally in the Greek, it says the spot. When Jesus reached the spot. What spot? What spot is he talking about? The spot right beneath the exact tree that Zacchaeus had chosen to climb. My friends, he was always headed there. You see, where is he going? To Jerusalem. Yes, there's things that are going to happen in Jerusalem. And overarching, the big picture is, yes, that is where he's going. But today, today, where is Jesus going to? He's going to the spot 
That's where Jesus is going. When Jesus reached the spot, the exact spot in the exact moment where he would meet Zacchaeus, that's where he's going. The moment of his salvation has come, and it was ordained before Zacchaeus was born. So when I asked you, which came first? Zacchaeus' interest in Jesus or Jesus' interest in Zacchaeus, which one is it? Jesus' interest in Zacchaeus, long before he was even born, he pointed at him and said, that's the spot right there, right beneath that tree, before the tree even grew. When the tree started to sprout, God's looking at that tree and going, that's the spot right there. That's where Zacchaeus is going to get saved. I'm going there on that day. How cool is that? What's even cooler is, every one of you in this room who are saved, There was a spot that God chose for you. Do you remember where the spot was? You remember, don't you, Ruthie? Where was it? Ruthie wasn't going to take no for an answer? No, Why? You've really changed. When I walked out, my boss's brother-in-law was there who was a pastor, and a guy named Bob Hewitt. He went outside, and I, he goes, what can I do for you? I go, I am going to tonight to eat at the restaurant. The restaurant. Was it daytime or nighttime? Night. All the people started out. See? Okay. That's the spot. That's the spot. Long before you were even born, Ruthie, Jesus chose that spot right there. Like X marks the spot. Like right there, that's what he did. And he did the same thing for many of us. Uh, Many of you have heard me before tell the story of a man named Mel Trotter. Now, you might know Mel Trotter mission in Grand Rapids. But just to review, if you've not heard it in a while, or maybe you've never heard it, Mel Trotter was a drunk who couldn't stop drinking even to the point of impoverishing his family and then couldn't stop drinking to the point where he wasn't around anymore, including the time where his son, his two-year-old son, got dreadfully sick and died in his mother's arms. He was gone and he had been out drinking. He came home and put his arms around his wife and swore on the baby's coffin that he'd never touch another drop. And two hours after the funeral, he staggered home blind drunk. And that was the day. On that day, January 19th, 1897, Mel Trotter made the decision to kill himself. Mel hopped a Chicago-bound freight train and arrived in a bitter snowstorm and sold his shoes for another drink. Barefoot, broke, and drunk, Mel staggered toward Icy Lake, Michigan to end his life, unable to break his habit, unable to keep his promises. Mel's progress brought him past the door of the Pacific Garden Mission. Harry Monroe, who himself had been an alcoholic, was leading the singing. And as the doorman helped Mel in, Monroe stopped to pray for Mel, and he said, Oh God, please save that poor, poor boy. Monroe told the audience of his own past and how Christ had delivered him from alcohol. Mel listened and believed, and that night he answered Monroe's invitation to make room for God in his life. Monroe explained that Jesus loved him and would change him. And that's exactly what Jesus did. In 1900, City Rescue Mission was founded in Grand Rapids, and Mel was asked to lead it. In 1925, Mel started opening other rescue missions across the country. He started over 60 missions in over 40 cities, instilling the hope of Jesus Christ and impacting thousands of individuals across the country who thought they were too far gone for Jesus to save them. Shortly before Mel's passing, City Rescue Mission was renamed Mel Trotter Rescue Mission. And also near the end of his life, he was asked once about the moment that he got saved. It had been years. And this is what Mel said. The moment happened on January 19th, 1897, 10 minutes past 9, Central Time, Pacific Garden Mission, Chicago, Illinois. That was the spot. 
the moment in time. Because God moves first, and that moment was ordained long before Mel was born. Jesus found me in the living room at 451 East Gardner, Sparta, Michigan, in 1989. Where did he find you? God moves first. He marks out a spot, and he heads directly there. So, look at number four. Because God moves first, God's kindness leads us to repentance and not the other way around. He chooses the spot, and he chose it long before you were born, which means his choosing that spot has nothing to do with what you've done. It has everything to do with who he is. You see, his kindness leads to repentance. Look at the verses, right? So he came down once and welcomed him gladly, right? He's off the tree now. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, because of course we do. We don't love it when Jesus gets around saving people that we don't think can be saved. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give all, I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. That's repentance. But which came first? Jesus' kindness to him or his repentance? Jesus' kindness to him came first. He said, get down off the tree, man. I got to have a meal with you. And at this time, having a meal with somebody is one of the most personal things you could do with them, one of the closest things you could do with them. And it was kind of a public thing because many houses had courtyards in which people could clearly see who you were having dinner with. It's like having a dining room that was lined with windows directly to the outside. And Jesus says, I'm coming to your house today. And he says this to him before Zacchaeus, is, before Zacchaeus mutters a word. He says this. It's amazing. God's kindness leads to repentance. Romans 2 teaches us this. In fact, it says, hey, listen, you shouldn't judge people because chances are the things you're judging them for are the same things that you yourself do. So don't be offended that I'm calling people to myself because my kindness leads to repentance. That's what he says. And this is the truth. Luke 6 also says that God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. This is God's first move. When he moves first, he moves in kindness. And that is designed to lead us to repentance. So this should tell us something. Look at this in your notes. The first thing believers are supposed to be to the rest of the world is kind. The first thing that we as believers are supposed to be to the rest of the world is kind. Can you imagine what we're doing? If we are moving out there into the unbelieving world and the first thing that we're doing is not kind, we are not kind. We are by definition not doing what our Heavenly Father does. And we are by definition not doing what he did for us. When God chose X marks the spot to go and get me and to go and get you, it had nothing to do with anything that I had done. Total kindness on God's part to decide to save us. So when we move out into the rest of the world, we move with kindness. Because that's what leads to repentance. Beating someone over the head with the Bible does not lead to repentance. Avoiding an unbeliever who makes me uncomfortable does not lead to repentance. Repentance. Chastising and mocking an unbeliever for their politics because their politics are a threat to my own does not lead to repentance. But kindness does. Radical, undeserved, bold in the face of mistreatment, kindness. That's what does. So if that's true, last thing in your notes. We must seek lost people. Look at how the story ends. Zacchaeus repents, and Jesus said to him in verse 9, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Boy, I will say so. That's what Jesus came to do. He's moving to Jerusalem. He's going there. He's traveling, but he has already marked out X marks the spies. Like, guys, I got to take a detour, because today I'm going to the house of Zacchaeus, because he is going to get saved. And that is how we should 
do life. The problem is for you and me as Christians, when it comes to other people who are not yet believers, we tend not to be seekers, we tend to be sitters. I I just kind of sit. And maybe if God brings an unbeliever my way and they bump into me long enough, then I'll talk to them about Jesus. And, and, And really what needs to happen is we need to develop a seeking mentality. Because God has already lined this out. He's already chosen X marks the spot. And so right here, right now, I just want to challenge you with this the rest of this week. God moves first. And there are people in your life he's already moved on and he's already moving in. And so here's the question I want you to ask yourself. If you are a Christian, here's the question. Who needs what I have? Do you have a faith worth having? If you have a faith worth having, here's the question. Who needs what I have? Is there a coworker? Is there another family member? Is there a, another friend? Is there somebody that God has placed in your life? See, the men in the room who have come to our men's stuff know what I'm talking about when I say, you're the one who has that key. I had them take out their keychain one time, and I said, here's the keys. And I said, there are keys that only you have in your life. There are only doors that you can unlock and nobody else can. There's conversations only you can have and nobody else can have because you've got that key. I don't have that key. Well, for those of you who are thinking right now, who needs what I have? There's somebody there and only you have that key. (laughs) And so I encourage you to seek them out. Ask yourself, who needs what I have? And make one move. Ask a question. Start a conversation. Invite them to Easter Sunday. Make one move, because we should, as believers, be seeking people, because we serve a seeking Savior. And at one point in time, he sought you out. And now we are his ambassadors, as though he was making his appeal through us, 2 Corinthians 5. It's exactly what he's doing. So let us go out there and seek as well, and watch who comes to Jesus, because the truth of it is, he moves first, and anyone can get saved.